May I speak in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, just who is the greatest then? Muhammad Ali thought he was. Jose Mourinho, when first joining as Chelsea manager, said he was the special one. And Winston Churchill was voted the greatest Briton on the BBC TV series. This is what they were arguing about on that time that we read in the Gospels. Jesus has concluded his ministry around the edges of Galilee and turning his face much more towards Jerusalem and the death that he was to encounter, as we read in the first few verses. And meanwhile, his disciples who'd listened to the inner workings of his mind and what he had come to do, his aim and mission in his life, they'd been, they'd been given the secrets, the inside story, if you like, of what great really looked like, were continuing to argue about who amongst them was the greatest. It must have been rather disappointing. A bit like watching Ipswich Town yesterday playing Bolton, uh, a nil-nil draw, even though they had ten men, but we'll have more of that later over coffee. What is the definition of great? The Oxford English Dictionary suggests a few, above the average. Preeminent, grand, distinguished, remarkable, great as in habitual, as in larger. I'm not sure it's Muhammad Ali, Jose Mourinho, or even Winston Churchill, but I would suggest that Jesus Christ should rank as one of the greatest. Whatever your views and faith, there is little doubt he has perhaps made the most single greatest contribution to change the world as we know it. A professor at Yale University says this, Regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If greatness is measured by numbers who follow the ways of somebody else, then Jesus tops it all. In 2010, it's estimated that 2.2 billion of 6.9 billion of the world's population followed the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's 31% of the world's population, the largest religion by far. The Christian faith is growing in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, Oceania, and don't let the papers misguide you, even in parts of Suffolk too. <laughs> if greatness is measured by the change brought to the world, then Jesus is truly great. Christian writer and church leader John Ortberg suggests there are six surprising ways that Jesus has changed the world. Firstly, he's changed the world through the status of children. Very appropriate today. I was thinking of Joshua and Toby. Children used to be sold into slavery. If they were of the wrong gender, and you can guess which, they were killed. Much of that has gone, chiefly by the influence of Jesus Christ. Education, certainly in this country, has been transformed through the influence of this one great man. Most of our universities, much of our school system, owes its foundation to the life of the church. Oh, that the secular authorities would remember that from time to time. Compassion has been winded, widened, so the poor and the sick are no longer ostracized. A note here, perhaps for Joe, as new dean, the Council of Nicaea decreed that wherever cathedral existed, there must be a hospice, a place of caring for the sick and poor. Jesus thought and changed our attitude towards humility, which we'll think about in a few moments. Greatness is not about rank and privilege. Greatness is about washing each other's feet, or doing the most menial of tasks of cleaning up your sick relative when the residential home, or washing your car, or think of any modern-day equivalent that you would like. This is true greatness. Greatness is about forgiveness. Forgiveness is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Greatness is not about punishing your enemies and rewarding your friends, but going the extra mile 
are giving somebody something they don't deserve. I could go on, but I won't because I know time is pressing. So who is the greatest and how can we live great lives? For Toby and for Joshua, it's great to think that your children are going to be great. There is a danger, though, in our society of pushing expectations on our children, which is really quite beyond them. I have two children, and I know that they're not all innocent and angels all the time. They're now 33 and 31, and I've now got a grandchild as well. And our grandchild stayed with us this weekend, and Beth, being two, has bossed the house around the whole weekend. So I'm pleased to be here where I'm no longer under her authority. But seriously, when we think about children, sometimes we put and load onto them expectations of greatness. Speaking to some of teenagers and some of our youth workers, one of the presenting problems amongst our young people are mental health issues because of expectations that are placed on them both by their peers, perhaps through social media, but those expectations of helicoptering parents who are forever watching their every move and there's no room to breathe and become the person that they are. How can then we become great? The passage gives us a few clues. Firstly, it's about putting ourselves last and others first. I hope you notice a strong northern accent as I said the word last there. I'm quite proud of that. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last. Literally, the translated, the words could mean, if anyone wants to be great, he will be last. My mother-in-law recently died, and a story was told at her funeral, and that when she and her other daughter went to the Eiffel Tower to visit it, they went up and had to wait for some lift to go even higher. Unbeknownst to them, they thought they were at the back of the queue, waiting, facing a double doors uh, at the, in front, and, but behind them was another set of double doors and a large queue had formed before them, and then the doors behind them suddenly opened, and they were whooshed into the doors immediately. They were, la they were last, but then they became first. That happened by accident. The true pursuit of greatness means putting ourselves intentionally last, letting others go first. I still have that quaint habit of opening the door for people and letting them go through. I've noticed that not everybody has that habit. I still maintain that habit. Mother Teresa, in an acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979, told a story that illustrates what great might look like. One evening, she said, we went out and picked up four people from the street, and one of them was in the most terrible condition. I told the sisters, you take care of the other three, and I will take care of the one who looks worse. So I did for her all that my love could do. I put her in bed. And there was such a beautiful smile on her face, she took hold of my hand and she said only one word, thank you. And then she died. I could not help but examine my conscience before her. And I asked, what would I say if I were in her place? And my answer was very simple. I would try to draw a little attention to myself. I would have said, I am hungry, I am dying, I am cold, I am in pain or something. But she gave me much more. She gave me her grateful love. And she died with a smile on her face. She put herself last. Notice God is sometimes found in the people that we encounter, not just in those who are delivering something of God's love towards them. True greatness involves being the servant of all. Instead of desiring to be a king or close to those who the world perceives to have power, we are to come to be like Jesus, who was the servant of all. There's another incident later on in Mark's Gospel when James and John are arguing of who should sit at the right and the left hand, the place of power, when Jesus comes into his kingdom. And Jesus said these words, you know that those who regard as losers of Gentiles lord it over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and who wants to be first must be the slave of all. A servant is concerned with serving others, 
And we can do that both in the church where we learn what it is to serve each other, but we model it in the rest of our lives. We spend 97% of our time not actually in the cathedral. We spend it actually outside trying to live out our Christian life, either at school or in college or university, in our workplace, in our homes. What does greatness look like there? It means being a servant. Robert Greenleaf, former director of management development and later writer, coach, and consultant, wrote a seminal essay some time ago called The Servant as Leader. A servant leader, he says, focuses primarily on the growth and well-being of people and the communities to which they belong. Instead of accumulating power and trying to get to the top of the pyramid, servant leadership looks very different. Servant leadership shares power. It puts the needs of others first and helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. As parents, we have that charge before us. As a family of the church, as we welcome children into the life and the communion of the church, we share that responsibility to serve them. And finally, true greatness involves never forgetting our utter dependency on God. We are to become, as Jesus showed here, like a little child. He puts a child amongst them, and he also holds a small child. He exalts them when their society did not exalt them. They were regarded as the least, the last, the unimportant. We have echoes of that perhaps in our own child, childhood, when children were to be seen but not heard were to be not allowed to come to things like funerals or other occasions. Tom Wright observes that in the ancient world they had little status or prestige, yet ch Jesus constantly used his children as examples of what the kingdom looks like. If you want to know what greatness looks like, says Jesus, then look at this child. As you welcome them, you welcome me, and you welcome the one who sent me. The reason why the kingdom belongs to children is not because of their supposed innocence or sinlessness or purity, but rather their object helplessness. When our Beth was born over two years ago, she was born with complications. She was utterly and totally helpless. She may have been starved of oxygen at her birth and we didn't know what the outcome was. My son was devastated. The joy of a first child had now come crashing down. Thankfully, after eight days in special care unit, she recovered well, and there was no sign of any permanent damage. But it was a reminder of our utter dependence on something other than ourselves. On Friday, I took the service of my mother-in-law, and she had degenerated over the last nine years, in the last three years not knowing really who she was. She had become utterly dependent once more on others. And I had the privilege of seeing my two boys and my, sis my sister-in-law's two boys carry her into the crematorium on Friday. We, leave, we enter the world with nothing and we leave the world with nothing. I'm not trying to be morbid, and to find reminders of the importance of what true greatness looks like. Greatness means putting ourselves last and others first. Greatness being, means being the willing servant of all. Greatness is never forgetting our utter dependency on God. Eugene Paris Peterson, his paraphrase of this passage in the message, translates it like this. He put a child in the middle of the room, then cradling the little one in his arms, he said, whoever embraces one of these children embraces me, and far more than me, God who sent me. So let's embrace Toby. Let's embrace Joshua. Let's embrace everyone who comes through these doors to discover what true greatness looks like. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.